standing, please get your Bibles. Go to the book of Joshua, chapter number 24. We'll go ahead and clear the platform. I've got a little introduction to do here. And uh, thank you, fellas. Thank you for the good music tonight. Wasn't that a blessing, church? And I appreciate everything everybody does here. Uh, I appreciate our nursery. Uh, thank God for our nursery. Mrs. Tharp is in there tonight, uh, uh, senior. And, and uh, also uh, uh, Heather Dale is in there. And then our wiggle worms. And uh, Pastor Bernberg, he was telling me, he said, we sing a song in master clubs that wiggle worms are not a good thing. We're supposed to stomp the wiggle worm. And that's uh, Brother Caleb's favorite song, I think. And, uh, and speaking of that, you know, here in the auditorium, we got to do our best to keep things quiet. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and I, I don't want anybody to be awkward, but I, I will say this. If your kids will not be quiet, just take them out of the room. There's other people here, amen? And so we all work together on that. Thank you for being kind and uh, understanding. Uh, we're going to read the verses in just a moment, uh, chapter 24. And I told you I was done. I told you I was finished with Joshua. And I told my wife, I said, I really feel like I've got to preach another message out of this book. And Because uh, the Holy Spirit kind of checked me, and I use that figure of speech uh, or put a hook in my jaw and said, oh, the last five verses don't matter. <laughs> and so I'm going to preach the last five verses. And uh, to get to that, uh, I found uh, a commentary by one of the great, great Sunday school organizers and teachers from the 20th century, Dr. Elmer Towns. Elmer Towns was associated with Jerry Falwell. And God used him in such a big, big way. But Elmer Towns, he, he did this comparison and contrast between Joshua and Moses. And I'll get to it, just stay with, right here if you need to be seated, just two more minutes. He gave 10 things that Moses and Joshua were the same. There, in other words, the similarities. I'll give them to you quick. One, both began ministries in the presence of God. Moses started on the burning bush, remember that? And Joshua in chapter 1, where God called him personally. Both of them led the people. Number three, both led over a body of water. Red Sea, River Jordan. Both saw a pre-incarnate form of Christ. Both saw Jesus. Both spoke with the Lord. Think about that. Number six, both enjoyed divine establishment. Where God established Moses and God established Joshua. There's verses for all that. Both sent spies. One sent 12, the other sent two. Uh, uh, Moses and, uh, uh, pardon me, Moses gave property to the two and a half tribes on the east side. Joshua was the one that actually awarded it to them. Similar, similar. Uh, both were called, ready for this, the servant of the Lord. Can you imagine God calling you that, the servant of the Lord? The number 10, both gave a final speech. Isn't that something? Here are some of the contrasts Dr. Towns pointed out. Uh, one was from the first generation, the other was the second generation. Powerful. One led in the wilderness, the other led in the promised land. Uh, Moses lifted up his arms in battle. Not Joshua. Joshua sent the Levites first in battle. It's different, different. Uh, the enemies of Moses were terrified of him. Yes, sir. But think about Joshua. They negotiated with him. There are some differences there. Regardless, the impact of Moses and later the impact of Joshua was detectable and undeniable. Would you agree with that? Say amen. amen. So here are these last verses after Joshua's final words. The Holy Spirit says, just a minute. I know he said his final but I want to say something after he's done. And we'll read these five verses uh, here in Joshua 24. And we'll read verse 29 to the end. Now we don't do this always, but I'd like you to join me in reading. And I'll give you a verse. And what we'll do is you read the, the odd verses with me. And I'll read the even verses. And uh, the reason I want to do this from time to time is I want to make sure everybody's using the same Bible. Yeah. Amen. We use a King James Bible here, no, no discussion about it. 
and it's easy to read and understand, and sometimes reading it out loud helps. So we'll read the odd together. I'll read the even by myself, beginning in verse 29. Read with me now. Ready, begin. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaish. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for an hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained unto Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. Tonight I'm speaking to you out of this passage with this title, Leave a Legacy. Leave a Legacy. Father, I pray now for your anointing, your help. I pray that, Father, you help me be a pastor tonight. I, I, I am a preacher, but I'm also a pastor. And I pray that you'd use what uh, I believe would be helpful to this church tonight. And, Lord, please fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing with me. It would seem pretty boring, really, to read these verses and expect to get a lot out of them. As a matter of fact, all these five verses really on the surface seem to give us is one thing, death. <laughs> I mean, look at it. Uh, it, it. It's just death after death after death. Look at verse 29. It, it says, and Joshua died. And then verse 30, the elders died. And then verse 32, the bones of Joseph. We're talking about death. Then verse 33, Eleazar, uh, the priest, the high priest after Aaron. He dies. And so it would seem on the surface that we have nothing but death and burial and end. And is everybody feeling good? Say amen. <laughs> it's, it's just what seems to be there. But I believe with the Lord's help tonight, there are some questions that we could and should ask ourselves. Why would God, the Holy Ghost, which by the way, every word in this Bible of the 66 books from Genesis to the Revelation Every word is put there by purpose and by the Holy Spirit. It's not accident. All of the genealogies and all the Dukes of Earl and uh, Duke, do you know the song I wrote years ago, Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, and uh, all of those uh, obscure and difficult passages, uh, I dare not make fun of the scriptures, but I am saying even those that we don't understand have purpose, relevance, and import, and it's just our job to find out what it is. Maybe sometimes God put it in there and he doesn't give us any reason for it. We can't find any inspiration out of it. But it's a good exercise to read the words of God. But here there has to be some, some probing questions around this whole subject here. And, and this is going to be a bit of a topical take from the text. And you'll see how I'll connect it in just a moment. And that's what you do when you have difficult, obscure texts. You just find out what is God trying to say to us. And what I get, first of all, just some questions. Write them down if you would. First of all, do you think it's likely that you will die? <laughs> it's not a trick question. I think it is. As a matter of fact, the stats are this. A hundred for a hundred. Uh, here's the second question. Do you have assurance after your death? You have assurance where you're going to be. Just a question. I'll touch them as we go. We'll stay long on those. Here's a third question. Do you ever think of the coming judgment that you will face? Do you ever think about it? Does it ever come into your mind? Here's a fourth question. Uh, do you envision tonight, can you envision tonight the legacy that you will leave behind? Because you're going to leave a legacy. Guaranteed. Here's your fifth question. I'll hit all these as I go along. Won't stay long on them, but uh, you'll hear how I do this. The fifth one is this, and this is an odd question. You ready for this? Do you have plans for your burial? Joseph did. 
So these are takeaways that we can draw from this text. And with the Lord's help, I, I hope you listen to me. Give me your hearing. Some of what I'm going to preach tonight, it might seem a bit elemental because you're saying, Preach, I've been saved a long time. I understand all this, but let's never get bored with what the Holy Spirit points out here. And the first is this. Do you think it's likely that you will die? You say, where do you take that from, preacher? Well, you see here, some great people died. And it is absolutely 100% accurate to say that I'm likely to die. Now, I don't know how that fits, likely, 100% accurate. But the fact is, there are some that may not die because we know in the Bible of two people that didn't die. And who can holler out their names? Enoch and Elijah. So Enoch and Elijah, there's two that didn't die. But did you know there's also going to be a great multitude of people who will not have to die? And we know them to be those in the what? The rapture. So we don't know. We don't know if we're going to be part of that group or not. But either way, we know it is likely we will die. Go to Genesis chapter 5 and get your Bibles. Now we're going to do some work. And uh, this is Sunday night church. This is uh, pastor time, teaching, preaching time. And I want you to look at chapter 5 and look at this redundant statement made again and again and again in Genesis chapter number 5. Uh, Adam, he's the man created in God's image and likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, verse 2, and blessed them and called their name Adam. And in the day when they were created, and Adam lived 130 years, begat a son of his own likeness, and after his image called his name Seth. And all the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, say it with me, and he died. One more time, and he died. And then if you took this passage and went down to verse number 8, look at verse 8, the last three words, say it with me, and he died. Verse 11, last three words, say it again, and he died. And we can go on and on and on through this chapter. Isn't it curious? It always ends up, and he died. I'm here to tell you tonight from our text, from the biblical record, and from our human experience, it is likely that we're all going to die. Not a question. It's absolutely going to happen. Now, why do people die? It's a result of sin. Why do people get cancer? It's a result of sin. Why do people suffer with arthritis? Well, it's because they get old. And aging is because of sin. It's all a result of sin. Everything that vexes us as human beings is a part of the curse given to us in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 19, which says this, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, uh, till thou shalt return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, and unto the dust shalt thou return. God said, you receive a curse of death, and that death is all-inclusive. Every one of us suffer death, suffer the ravages of death, suffer the, the consequences of death. It's all part of our experience. Why Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death was passed upon all men for that what? All have sinned. So every one of us will die, unless the rapture. We understand that, right? We already mentioned who are the two people that didn't die? I'm trying to make sure these kids remember that. Enoch and, let's turn it around. Elijah and Enoch. Let's try it one more time. Who are the two? And who else? Split, spit it around. There you go. And anybody that will be in the rapture. So, so we know this, that we're all going to die. But let's be honest about something here. We act, we perform, we live like we're never going to die. I ran seven miles this afternoon. As I'm running those seven miles, I was thinking about Ross Shaughnessy. Ross Shaughnessy was 58 years old, active duty Air Force, uh, a career man. Uh, afterward, he became in the reserves. And Ross Shaughnessy, I was his pastor, and I love Brother Shaughnessy, good Irish fellow from Holyoke, Massachusetts. 58 years old, he's running at Barnes Air Force Base there in Westfield, Massachusetts. He was running on a Saturday afternoon. He dropped dead on the track and never moved another muscle. 58 years old. And I thought about it today. I thought, my soul, wouldn't that be something? I'll hit that on the end. Think of the result of that if I, if I did drop dead today. It would shake you up, I think. It might shake up 
uh, 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 people more than others, especially my own family. Uh, but the fact is, everyone will die. Let me, let me just get your attention here. I'm not going to be morbid here tonight, but I do have to make my point here that everyone is going to die. I want us to listen tonight. Because the Bible is clear. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So it's clear we're going to die. Now the reality is, and, and stay with me now, the reality is our time is framed. Our time is, is limited. Our time is measured. And the final word here, our time is finite. Let's be reminded of that. Joshua died. Uh, Eliezer died. Moses died. Adam died. And all men will die. The Bible tells us Jesus' words in Revelation chapter 2 in verse number 10. Jesus speaking there. Uh, he said, be thou faithful unto death. Now just let that sink in. Be thou faithful unto death. Now, you're not going to be faithful unto death if you're living every day like you're never going to die. It's a conundrum. We live like we're going to live forever. And, and, and I said, I ran today, and I'm realizing that, that I could have dropped dead, and I'm not saying anything's wrong, everything's fine for us, I know. Uh, but the fact is, if you're living like you're never going to die, I wonder about your faithfulness. Faithful unto death. And what does Jesus go on to say? And I will give thee the crown of life. Think about that. That's Revelation 2.10. So we know, number one, everyone will die. This is all under that first question. Do you think it's likely you will die? Here's the second thing. Physical death is not the end of anyone. That's true, isn't it, church? It's not the end of anyone. Now I want you to go to a New Testament text. Go to Luke chapter number 9, if you would, please. And we'll be going back and forth to different passages. Luke chapter number 9. And I want you to see one of the great highlights in the life of Christ. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, Dr. Tom Malone, my pastor, when I was in Bible college, he preached a series of messages on the mountaintop experiences of Jesus. The mountaintop experience, the mountain peaks of Christ, he called it. The mountain peaks of Christ. One of the mountain peaks was right here in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we won't read the whole text, but I do want you to catch just something very, very curious, verse number 28, where the Bible says, It came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, James, and John, John and James, and went up into a mountain to pray. Isn't that funny? It says Peter, John, and James. It's usually Peter, James, and John, isn't it? I just caught that. I don't know why it's switched there. Uh, but uh, to pray. And, he pray, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white as glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were who? Moses and Elias. What in the world, Elias, Elijah? These, this is astounding. Now, you say, what's so astounding about it? Well, there's some interesting things to consider here. First of all, there was no Snap, uh, uh, no uh, uh, Instagram, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook. So far as I know, Peter, John, and James, I've got a little mind bubble there. Peter, John, and James had never seen any image of Moses or Elijah. Had no concept what they looked like. There was no clue. You understand that, right? There was no uh, encyclopedias. There was no uh, Time magazine that did a cover story on the greatest man of the generation. None of that. They had no clue. So we understand here's some men that were dead and gone for years. Not only that, but they were recognized. Look what the Bible says here in, in Luke 9. Uh, where was I at? I forgot where I was at there. Uh, 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 Okay, but thir verse 32, Peter, Peter, they were with him, were asleep, and they were woke, and uh, uh, no, verse 33, it, it says, it said, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and I catch us, one for Moses, one for Elias. He knew who they were. I don't see anything in here that he was personally informed on this, but isn't it interesting? He figured out who they, they knew them. So the first thing is this, they were dead and gone for years. Secondly, they were recognized. And thirdly, they knew their names. Oh, my soul, think about that. That teaches us some things, doesn't it? It teaches us, first of all, that there is life after death. It teaches us also that there's recognition after death. Is everybody hearing me? 
Does that help anybody? Sure it should. And not only that, but there's also identity after death. We're not a bunch of floating orbs in heaven, all looking the same, sounding the same. No, no, no. I'm telling you who you are today, you will be who, who, uh, forever. I'll start, try to say that again. Who you are today, you will be forever, except without sin. Amen. So I, I, this is a beautiful thing. So, so what we're saying is you're going to die. There's no question about it. Joseph died. In Genesis chapter 50, let's go back over there now. Genesis 50. Now, don't you love your Bible? Genesis chapter number 50. Everybody go over there, please. You've got to see these words because this actually gives us the format for what happened here in Joshua when they took the bones of Joseph. Look at just uh, chapter 50 and verse number 22. Now, we know Joseph was a great, great man, one of the greatest men in all the Bible. Nothing bad said about him, a tremendous picture of Christ in so many different ways, sold by his brethren, you know, saved the world. There's beautiful, beautiful Christ-like images through Joseph. And here in Joseph's story, verse number 22, he dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years, same as Joshua. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, and the children also of Machar, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you. Boy, let me tell you right now, I want you to underscore those words. That's a very important statement with regard to those Jews. Because Joseph is the gateway to the to the. 400 years of bondage in Egypt. It was Joseph that allowed that to take place. God superintended in all this. You remember, Joseph and his brothers came, and Joseph said, bring my daddy. Jacob came, Jacob dies. They bury him outside of Egypt. <clears throat> but Joseph here is the, is the progenitor, if you will, of that whole association uh, by God's sovereign plan to bring Israel into captivity for four years so he could raise up a man named Moses who would come along and put blood on doorposts to picture God's deliverance of his children. But Joseph says, I die and God will surely visit you. Notice, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and ye shall carry my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. He's put in a coffin in Egypt. But Joseph said, you're not leaving me there. He said, you will not leave me in Egypt. Don't leave me in Egypt. Listen to me. I think we, we think a little too loosely, church, about these bodies. I'm going I'm to get personal with somebody. You need to listen to me. Give me a hearing. Joseph said, this body is going to leave Egypt and be brought to the land of my father's promise. His bones. He knew, he said he knew that, 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 that he would probably decompose and, and, and obviously decompose. And he said, I want you to carry my bones out of Egypt and bring them to the land promised to my father, Amen. Jacob. And to his father, Isaac. And to his father, Abraham. We're a little too loose about these bodies. We're a little too loose about them. We think loosely. Why, it would shock you how many Christians today are cremating. Now, I know I'm touching on something a lot of preachers wouldn't even get near to. But listen to your pastor. God has given you a body. And I am telling you, and, and, and don't come to me later and tell me you've got a cremation all planned. I'm not going to argue with you. And I don't want to get into an argument with anybody about that. But I want to tell you something. Joseph said this, you take care of my bones. Amen. You take care of my bones. And don't put me, uh, don't put me here. Take me out of here. I've heard this all my ministry. I don't matter. Throw me in a hole, cover me up with dirt, it don't matter. Yes, it does matter. There are more people involved in this than you. There's a legacy. A legacy. We don't put people on, on mantles and, 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 and remember their legacy that way. There needs to be a reminder, a legacy. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, I remember this. Listen, I remember this fellow. I uh, did his funeral. 
uh, he got cremated and uh, they stuffed him in, in uh, shotgun shells. And he said, I just want to be blown over the woods that I love to hunt in. So, so much for a legacy. Pfft, gone. Listen, what about the second, the third generation children where there's nothing to come and remember? Yeah. The legacy of grandpa. Yeah. The legacy of grandma. And, and I, knew, I knew it'd get quiet right there. And that's all right. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not here to change anybody's will or to make anybody feel awkward. I've been doing this a long time, but trust me, I'm telling you straight that your body is something very special. And you're made in the likeness and image of God. You are a living testimony and a dying testimony. And so here we have Joseph's faith and his expectation in God. He says, you bring my bones out of here. You know what else here? Not just uh, his expectation of deliverance, but I think Joseph had an expectation of resurrection. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I believe he knew his Bible. People, listen to me. We must not become paganized and lose our dignity of life. Come on. Amen. Yeah. We're not dogs and we're not cats and we're not cows. Right. Amen. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. And I'm a living testimony of God's creation. There's nothing like us. Look at your wife and say, I see, I told you there's nothing like me. <laughs> Joseph, bones are buried later. And by the way, it, notice what it says there uh, in, uh, uh, oh, back in Joshua. Go back to Joshua if you would. There's a little statement there. And I don't know how to unpack it, but I... I, I, I want you to see this. In Joshua 24, verse 32, we'll skip, you know, the bones of Joseph. The, you know, they bought the ground where, where he's buried. And notice the last statement in verse 32. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. I believe structured right in the middle of that inheritance of the children of Joseph was the bones of Joseph. An inheritance. And so, so I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm spending more time on this than I intended, but I am saying to you, uh, plan, you're going to die, but your body is a special thing uh, from the Lord because physical death is not the end. And by the way, it's not the end of your body. It's not the end of your body. I was recently watching something uh, exhuming the uh, remains of uh, German soldiers that were buried in Poland. The German government wanted to have these men brought to a German cemetery. You know what? That's an honorable thing. They dug and tore down trees and actually removed other gravestones to get the bodies of these soldiers that were killed in battle. Those people that were doing that, and I thought to myself, Brother Glenn, I thought I would be honored to involve myself in such an effort of exhuming uh, uh, heroes. And again, these are Germans. Like what you want, say what you want. These men died for their country. And I don't believe most of them were Nazis either. I just think they were fighting because they were told to. And they're digging up the remains of these boys that died. And, you know, it's a special thing. I recently, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Brother Josh, uh, 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 James Patterson, went and visited the battlefield here in our uh, own state, South Carolina. And uh, uh, we saw, in, in not a large uh, battle, but, but uh, several uh, dozen men were killed in battle there. And, and the great carefulness that they, they took measures to take, to take those bodies and put them in a place of legacy. Is everybody hearing me tonight? You're a legacy. You're a living legacy of God. And, and we're going we're gonna to develop that as we go along here. Uh, so is everybody still with, with me in the message? I hope you are. I really mean that. Ah. Just throw me in a hole, cover me up. I don't need nothing. I don't want anybody crying over me. I don't want anybody walking by feeling bad. You know, there's more people involved in than, than just you. Yeah. Amen. I just thought I'd put that out there. But can you imagine this? For 40 years, they traveled the wilderness, and they had this coffin. 40 years. Yeah. Wouldn't you think, Brother, Brother Todd, that along the way, somebody said, listen, Jack, yeah. is there any way we can ditch the old guy? <laughs> I mean, man, we've been traveling along here. It seems like this, this coffin is just clanking around with us everywhere we go. And, uh, and, and sure enough, you know that happened. Come on. 
I mean, listen, after 40 years, and then, and then for seven or 20 years in, in fighting through Canaan, they're dragging Joseph's coffin all over the place. They're like, when are we getting rid of the old guy? No, <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. In my mind, it's hilarious. You're know, dragging this coffin around. But that's what they did. They carried it everywhere. David recognized there'd be a resurrection one day. He said, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. Remember that? Moses said, choose life. Choose life. Daniel said this in Daniel 12, 2. Look it up later. He said, and many that, uh, that sleep shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and, rep and uh, reproach. Yeah. And I want to tell you something, we're all going to wake one day because death is not the end. So, so first question is, do you think it's likely that you'll die? And of course the answer is yes, but thank God it's not the end. Question number two is this, do you have assurance where you will go after death? Now I don't need to spend a lot of time on this because really if you have that assurance, you have it simply by one means and that's what Jesus said, if you accept me, you have life everlasting. Amen. Jesus told us in Matthew 16 and verse 26, he said, For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Let me stop there. Are you a child of God? Are you a child? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They follow me. I know my sheep, he said. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, would you go over there please? Pardon me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you people are doing so good. I appreciate you listening so well. You say, how do you know we're listening? I can read faces. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, would you look there please? Just a couple things I want to point out here in these two verses. Great verses, great verses. You know these verses. In fact, you ought to mark them in your Bible. Uh, you ought to mark these kind of verses. We are confident, I say, and willing rather... Paul says, to be absent from the body and to be present, say it church, with the Lord. Now, from the body, with the Lord. Two powerful prepositional phrases. From the body, that's talking about what church? From, absent from the body, what's that talking about? You're dead. What is from the body? The soul, that's right. That's the eternal part of you. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. You know, it's amazing in this modern age. I've watched it so many times. And again, I'm getting personal. I want to hurt anybody's feelings. God knows my heart. But we have this insatiable desire to keep people living at whatever it takes. Right? And we pump them full of morphine and we pump them and we pump them and we, we put life. I'm being very careful here because I've been in these shoes. Been in these shoes. And, and we, we think, oh, we gotta, gotta keep them living, gotta keep them living, gotta keep them living. And all we're doing, folks, is we're denying ourselves the great, wonderful comfort that says to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Amen. What are we doing to ourselves? Yeah. We're, we're, we're hurting ourselves. We're, we're not being uh, uh, wise and biblical. Well, whatever it takes, we gotta, we got to keep people living longer and longer and longer. Listen, to be absent is to be present. Think about that. And so consequential to that, ladies and gentlemen, I can say to you emphatically, there's no need for fear in death. We need not fear death. Now, I know this is a heavy talk, but if you just keep listening, there's, a, there's an effervescence to it. Because, thank God, I'm not up here, you know, I'm not your, your undertaker planning your funeral. <laughs> I'm telling you as a Christian, I don't have to fear death. I can walk through life, I can endure sickness, I can go through trouble and not fear death. Why? Because absent from the body. Say it. You need to remember that. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. For we all must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's my third question. Are you preparing for the judgment seat? 
You say, wait a minute, man, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, preacher. I'm okay with everything you said so far. I know we're all going to die, and I don't have to fear death, but don't give me this judgment stuff. Okay, Hebrews says, it's pointed out a man wants to die, and after this, what? We're all going to judgment. You understand that, right? Look at me. Every one of us are going to judgment. There's nobody gets out of this. Every one of us have been consigned to facing our Lord. You can hide from me even when I'm preaching and duck your face and try to find a way out of uh, a conviction. And I want to tell you something. I can't bring you conviction, but I can sure bring you the truth. And the truth is, you're going to stand before God one day just like me. It is certain that we're going to stand in judgment. You say, well, why are you making such a heavy, heavy note on that? Because it's something we need to be very aware of. Very aware of. You think it's, uh, it's uh, easy? Well, let's look what it says. This is a tough verse. I don't know the whole extent of this verse, but look what it says. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. This is what throws me, whether it be good or bad. Now hold it, preacher. The bad stuff got all taken away when I prayed and and ask Jesus in my heart. All that bad stuff. So really, everything I did wrong is gone, and I got a free ride to heaven, right? Wrong! You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I know this. The Bible's clearly teaching in Romans chapter 8, there, ha- there is no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen right there. What sins are you talking about? Thank God my sins are forgiven. But you've got to take into your accounting what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, where he said that we will give account for every idle word. Anybody here guilty of idle words? It's kind of like in in a church. You're not particularly sinning. You don't have any, you know, thing that you can... You know, say a sin, but you're being idle as a Christian. And you know who's going to hold us accountable there? Is the Lord. He's going to hold us accountable. He's going to draw us up close. Like I told you, I don't know how to unpack this verse, Brother Wright. I've done my best to figure it out. But it says good or bad. Don't leave here saying that I think there's going to be sin judged at the judgment seat. I don't believe that at all. It's all under the blood. But I want to tell you something. If you think for a minute that you got a free pass, you're wrong. We've got this easy, easy Christianity today that is sickeningly sweet, here in the South especially, like the sweet tea. Yeah. And bless God, I can be a Christian, and, and I met him. Listen, I met scads of them yesterday knocking doors. Yes, your pastor goes door knocking, and you ought to fire him if he didn't. Yes, sir. Thank you for the three amens. Yep. Gets quiet when you know uh, uh, soul winning needs to come up in a church. But anyways, uh, knocking on doors yesterday, and my soul, the people I talked to, all of them saved, none of them in church. Does anybody have a problem with that? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands if you've got a problem with it. Sure you do. Sure you do. And it ought to be a problem. Good or bad. I don't know what it all means, but I want to tell you right now, there's no escaping this judgment seat of Christ. No free pass. Men, no free pass. Ladies, no free pass. You say, what, 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 what are you talking about? I'm talking about there's going to be an accounting. There's going to be an accounting. Uh, what's the accounting based on? Or what's it about, Pastor? I believe it's all around the fact that he is looking for his usefulness, our usefulness for his cause, our agreement in his purposes, and our reckoning will be based on how good we did that or how bad we did that. And so you could maybe do a better theological look into all that, but that, the fact is we're all going to appear. And is there any place in your daily or weekly life where you just can't see yourself in light of the judgment seat of Christ. You know, listen, your work time at work, yes, you're working for your boss. You're not there to be the, a pastor. You're there to be a, a, a shop worker. But you're going to give an account for how you behave. Come on, church. I, I, 
whether you like it or not, it's just the truth. And, and I'm just afraid a whole bunch of us are going to get to heaven. Or we're, going to go, we're going to go there, and I'm going to be standing there somewhere, and you're going to look at me and say, why didn't you tell us about this? You're going to try that, and the Lord's going to say, excuse me, I gave you a Bible too. <laughs> Amen? And I'll be going, yeah, see? <laughs> Can you see yourself in the judgment seat of Christ? I, I just, uh, I don't think we're all going to hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's just be honest. Anybody getting red-faced? I just don't think we're going to hear it. I think a whole bunch of us are going to be that one fella who buried his talent. And there's going to be a whole bunch of the two and the five, and oh, I'm praying to God. You say, oh, pastor, you're in good. Don't fool yourself. Just because you stand here, Brother McHale, that means nothing. Am I telling the truth? It means nothing. I'll tell you what, a, a Sunday school teacher, a bus worker, choir member, you say, oh, Pastor, it's such a little thing. But our Father in Heaven sees all this. And we're going to give an account. So, so, so I'm almost done. And you're saying, thank God. I feel like I've been to the dentist tonight. It's all right. Here's, a, here's the, the fourth one is this. What will your legacy be? What's your legacy going to be? My, I have an uncle, or I say I have, I had an uncle uh, who was on my, uh, pardon me, a great uncle. He was my, my grandmother's brother. Uh, would that be a great uncle? Okay. I had a great uncle. Th this is the truth now. He was, he was a flasher. They called him a flasher. He, he'd just run around flashing. And, and he had a, an overcoat, and he'd flash. And I never met him. I'm just telling you the truth. It's in my history. And my grandmother would talk about him, and she said, he's an awful man. And so I'm not going to name him, but he's known as the flasher in our family. That's his legacy. If I told you his name, you'd be shocked at the name because it just fits. You men can ask me later. Uh, what's your legacy going to be? Uh, Pastor, it sure ain't going to be the flasher, amen? <laughs> Rich man? Businessman? Bum? What's your legacy going to be? Uh, soul winner? Hard worker? How many would think tonight, when you think of Michael Jordan, what's, what's the legacy that comes to your mind? Please, be simple here. You know, I did this in the prayer meeting. I couldn't believe what was going on in that room. You know, uh, uh, James, please give me the answer. Just simple. Okay, but there's something more glaring here. Basketball! All right, let me come to this side of the room. <laughs> Tiger Woods, please. <gasps> All right, I'm going to try this one now. And we're not looking for draft dodger or Muslim wannabe. Muhammad Ali, otherwise Cassius Clay. What? Thank you. <laughs> uh, here's a name with an incredible legacy. William Tyndall. Hold your Bible up. You would not have this if it weren't for William Tyndall. You would not have a King James Bible. What a legacy. What a legacy. How many missionaries do we support, ladies? 73. There'd be no worldwide missions in most churches today if it weren't for the legacy of William Carey. What was that name? Kids, 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 what was that name? William Carey, great legacy. The man that preached the night I got saved has a legacy. Carl Hatch, what's his legacy, anybody? Soul winning. The sword of the Lord. John R. Rice, legacy. Uh, Joe Boyd, what's his legacy, preacher? 
revival. Uh, here we go. Charlton Heston. Yeah, but which movie? Come on, Caleb. The Ten Commandments. He was Moses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kids today. Anybody with me? Billy Graham. Unbelievable worldwide meetings. Greatest evangelist ever in history. As far as people conversion. It's just astounding what God did through Billy Graham. You ready for this one? Some of you are going to do this when you hear it. Ronald Reagan. What's that? He was the great orator. That's right. He was a great speaker. And in my opinion, the greatest modern president. Amen. So we could, we could go on and on with this. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Uh, Lottie Moon. Missions. Southern Baptist missionary to China. Lottie Moon gave her life for missions. And today around the world, churches, Southern Baptist churches, raise money in the memory, the legacy of Lottie Moon. My, my, I, I'm, I'm finishing everybody. Keep listening. And oh, just listen to me. My, my precious dad, I wish you could have met him. Just such a great man. And uh, in 2001, he, he came down with Guillain Barre syndrome, a horrible physical affliction, attacks the myelin sheath of the spinal column, and became totally paralyzed. One day, my brothers and I were talking about dad. You know, when brothers get together, they talk about you know, parents, and, and we were just talking about dad, and dad lost his speech, he couldn't talk right, he, he talked like the, his upper palate, I'm not making fun of him, just his upper palate was frozen, could hardly move his tongue, and he said, Eric, come here, and give me some Hershey syrup, Hershey syrup, I'd say, what dad? He said, Hershey syrup, he loved Hershey syrup, and I put it in milk, and he loved it. Uh, he, I'd, say, I'd say, you want Hershey syrup? I'd make, we had fun. So one day my brothers and I were talking. All we were doing was remembering that part of his life. And it was only five or four years of his life. And one day I said to Darren, I said, you know something? I really think we're, we're, we're cutting ourselves short here. Because all we do is talk about dad when he was paralyzed. What about the other part of his life? where he was a barnstorming, fire-breathing preacher. He'd tear pulpits up, fiends would pop, spit would come flying out of his mouth. He'd go up to doors and <laughs> knock doors and soul win, and, and, and he'd get up to people in their face, you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. That's the kind of guy he was. And also we realize that, that the legacy, and I'm trying to help you with something, and please listen to me. Don't consign the legacy of your family to one event. But maybe what you've done has made it that way. I have 11 grandchildren, and all of them know I'm a pastor. And uh, they, they obviously know what I do. And Buffy, I could ruin that. I could ruin it in a moment of time. And all of a sudden, Papa used to be a pastor. Papa used to. Isn't it true? We can, we can mess this thing up pretty quick, couldn't we? Have you thought about your legacy much? You're going to leave something. You're making something right now. But how are you doing at that? Are you, are, you, are you becoming grouchy as you get older? Guess what? You're probably going to be remembered for that. Bunch of grouchy. Stop being grouchy. Don't be so critical. Yeah. You say, well, mind your own business. Okay, I will. Just go ahead and leave your legacy. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because the way you're behaving is going to be left in their minds. Right. I want to go out smiling, yeah. passing out candy like Brother Welch. Yeah. 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 Blessing people. Loving people. Not feeling like I have to fix everybody. Yeah. You ever meet somebody like that? All they do is fix, 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 fix. You got to fix everybody. Yeah. You're driving people nuts. You're leaving a legacy whether you like it or not. I know I'm meddling tonight. Am I, am I meddling, Zach? Am I messing around? You know I'm telling it straight. Yeah. True. Abraham's legacy is what? 
friend of God. Hmm. What will your legacy be? I got to close. I really do. Paul's legacy, chapter two, chapter four, Second Timothy, verses six through eight. He said, "I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith." See, see, if you're short-sighted on your legacy, I got so many notes on this. If you're short-sighted in your legacy, if you're so minimal in your legacy, you are depriving you and your family of who you really are. So don't be temperamental. Stop it. Quit being so unhappy. Say, I ain't got anything to be happy about. Maybe go look at the pictures of your family. Yeah. Amen, church. Yes, uh, you're angry all the time. Guess how you stop doing that? Just stop it. Yeah. Quit being so angry all the time. Be real. Be true. Be faithful. In other words, put on Christ. Put on the good things of, of, of your spiritual inner man. And that can help feed the right kind of legacy. And then I've got to close with this. I, I, I've said tonight we're all going to die. Do you have assurance where you're going to be? Are you prepared for your day of accountability? Can you envision a legacy? And the final is this, and I only spend one minute on it. Where will you be buried? Do you have a place for burial? I'm being, I'm being very honest, very specific right now. I won't be a pastor to you men because listen to me, men. When you die, it will be the worst day of your wife's life. And you will die. Chances are you'll die before her. And when you die, if you don't help her out, I'm talking about place of burial. Who's going to speak at your funeral? Who's going to sing at your funeral? What's going to be done at your funeral? It's your job to make it so that you could say to your wife, baby, in the upper drawer or in the firebox is an envelope with some things that I want done at my funeral. Whether you're in your 50s or 60s or 80s or whatever, uh, do you have a place to be buried? Just take that and develop that in your mind. Lay's the same with you. I'm just telling you, these things are important. Joseph did. Joseph said, here's the plans for my burial. And I'm not talking about just a will, even though let me tell you something. Uh, I just soon give everything away before I die. Yeah. yeah. Just give it to God. Give it to missions. Come on, church. I could use an F-250 if you want to help me out. <laughs> Your unexpected death will bring the greatest week of confusion and calamity to your family than you could ever imagine. It's just the truth. And I, I know I'm, I'm ending this on some heavy stuff, but I am saying this. You need to decide where you're going to be buried, where, what, what's the stone going to be like, who, what's going to happen. Uh, I, I can tell you from personal experience that if you don't make those decisions, somebody's going to make them for you. And you will wish that you'd have made the decision. Am I telling the church right? You know that's true. We gotta we gotta make it easy on our families. Amen, church. So so I really think I really think we ought to take a, a yellow sheet and just sit there and write down some things that we ought to have in place because we're gonna die. And have this set up, especially if you have a splintered family. If you got what we call a blended family, you got this family, this family, this family, and all these little pieces come together. Listen, get this stuff clear so that when you're gone, it doesn't become this mushroom cloud of trouble because it will. Mark my words, it will. Mrs. McCarty, would you come, please? I asked her to read a poem. It's never easy, by the way, to lose a loved one, but it can be easier. Does that make sense? It's never easy, but it can be easier. I want you to listen to the words of this poem. This is an amazing poem. C.T. Studd, I'm still preaching. <laughs> I'm kidding. C.T. Studd, uh, one of the greatest men of the 20th century, and a missionary, just a great story. He wrote this poem, Only One Life, and I hope it'll bless you as she reads it for us. Go ahead, please. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice. 
bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life shall soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life shall soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow thy yes. word to keep. Yes. Faithful and true, what e'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn. Yes. Living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I'll say, I know I'll say, t'was worth it all. Mm. Only one life will yeah. soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Only one life. Let's stand together, please. Josh, I'm going to have you change the invitation song. I want you to play the, the third song of the tonight's congregational, Jesus Led Me All the Way. You play that for us. Let's start coming. If God has spoken to your heart, the invitation's open. God is dealing with you. Would you start coming? Start coming this way as he plays. Jesus led me all the way, step by step, day by day. As he plays, you, you come, altars open. Come on, church. God's spoken to you. Just take your life and lay it before him. Let him have first place. Thank you. God bless you. Keep coming. Jesus led me all the way, Jesus led me all the way, step by step. Keep coming if God has spoken to you. God is so good to us. He gives you the life that you have. Use it for His glory. Leave a legacy. Amen. Just keep praying. I'll sing that chorus. I love this song. Jesus led me all the way, led me step by step each day. I will tell the saints and angels as I lay my burdens down. Jesus led me all the way. Listen to this last verse. And hitherto my Lord hath led. Today he guides each step I tread. And soon in heaven it will be said, Jesus led me all the way. Isn't that great? Let him lead your life from earth to heaven. Everything in between. Don't have any gaps in your life where Jesus isn't in the lead. Thank God. Our Father, we thank you that you've spoken to our hearts tonight. And uh, Lord, help us to be different leaving than we were coming in. Help us to impact the life of some poor sinner on their way to hell. The hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of times that we've heard the gospel, there are people all over the low country tonight who've never had a clear explanation of Jesus' gospel. Lord, maybe people have heard it before and yet they've never accepted you. God, help us to be soul winners. Help us to live like tomorrow could be the last day of our life. Help us to live even the next 30 minutes would be our judgment seat experience. 
So God, bless us now, I pray, as we dismiss. Bless your people. Lord, thank you for them. Thank you for every person here tonight, Lord. We leave the, uh, have them leave tonight with the peace of God in their heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.